So how do you use drama as a learning medium? I think there are two things to bear in mind. One is frame, point of view. So we agree to think of ourselves as people running a museum or a tourist agency or whatever it might be. And this is our frame in the sense of it's a point of view. Whenever you have a job in life, it gives you a certain way of looking at the world. So we agree collectively. It's not about individual characters as it would be in the theatre. It's about a collective frame. And the other thing is sign. In theatre, you use sign. What do I mean by sign? Well, we are always reading things world around us. It's always like signs that are telling us things. <coughs> we do this automatically. So the example I like to use is um, I usually wear very colourful socks. This morning my socks are not so colourful but usually you can see them. It's mm -hmm. quite colourful. Exactly. Just like lice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and when you see someone with socks like that you think to yourself Ah, this person likes very colourful, stylish songs. So people might think that when they look at me. It's a sign that they read about me. Except some people who know me say not, oh, he likes colourful socks. They think, ah, his wife buys him his socks. That is the way they <laughs> That's <this> reality. Sign. <laughs> okay, so it's a sign. All the time in our environment, we're reading signs. So when you come, like, we have come to a city that is not so familiar to us, um, we are looking at, around us and we're seeing things and we're trying to work out the signs because it's not familiar to us. So when you cross the road in Augsburg, yes, there's this yellow box on a post that I believe you have to press so that the traffic lights will change. Yes? It's a sign. It's got sort of three dots on it. And so my colleague Richard and I have been going round and we thought what you had to do was hit this box or press it hard. And it was only later that I noticed somebody pushing something underneath that I realised that this is what you have to do. So I misunderstood the sign because I wasn't used to it. We're always reading signs all the time. But in theatre, you select the signs very carefully. If you're putting on a play, you select it. Theatre uses a sign. So if you put a character on stage in a red dress, you've chosen that. The actor, the director have chosen this because it's a sign about that character. It says something to the audience. And when you are in the theatre, you're watching very carefully, closely, all the time, and making sense of these signs. And this is something that you use in drama, in the classroom, as a way of exploring meaning. Does that make sense? I think I could talk about it this way. It's like a laboratory. This is what drama is in the classroom. It's a, we are exploring human behavior. And we're doing that through drama. That's what we're examining in the classroom. So we can change the classroom. So it no longer, there was, Dorothy said in Mantle of the Expert, the class, the space is never a classroom. It is the space where we work, where we run our company. So you change the room from being a classroom to in our heads, at least in our minds, in our imaginations, it is a different space. It is our workspace. So let us say this morning that we are a team, an expert team that work together. So, Heiko, what shall we be? Will we be a team of running a tourist agency or a, just give me something, imagine, agree something, a suggestion? You're running a zoo. Oh, we're running a zoo. Okay. So this space is going to be our office, yes? I'm not sure exactly whether we are in administration or whether we actually deal with the animals yet. 
but let's just make it our office space, the space we come to in the morning. So all around us, we will have signs, familiar signs. Um, I have done this. It's like this. You call it a tea urn, coffee urn. You know, it's where you have the hot water and you have a tap and that's where you get the hot water for your coffee. And so that will maybe be somewhere in our office. And I've also put a sign, written sign on it saying, please switch off at night. Kind of sign you might find next to the tea urn. So we could put this somewhere in our room, in our office, and it would be an indication to everywhere, oh, this is everyone, oh, this is where we get our tea and coffee. other signs that there might be in our office. Just ordinary things. It might be a computer, it might be a telephone, it might be um, a rotor about jobs that we have to do. There will be signs all over the room. Timetable. It could be a timetable. Offside. It could be, so it could be just a sign or it could be an object in the room. And I'd ask you to do a drawing. I have some, uh, a few pens. But just, yeah. um, just a quite a big, bold sign. Maybe it might be a telephone. Maybe there might be writing next to it. Like, not for personal calls, please, or something like that. Yes? So we have signs for exit, first aid, we have a sweet jar, a cookie jar, we have a timetable. Can I ask you to take your sign and find somewhere in the room, put this sign. I don't know if you can attach it to a wall or you can put it on a, rest it on somewhere. Where in the room might this sign be? Spread them out around the room. <laughs> In the office, in our office. So you might have people making themselves a cup of tea or coffee, you might have people um, checking the timetable, there might be some um, people getting their coats off or checking they've got everything in the first aid kit or can you find a position close to or near to one of these signs and just take a position where we can see something you are doing on this normal morning and you just take a position so it might be you're pouring yourself a cup of tea and you just hold it still it might be you're taking your coat off. It might be you are taking a sweet out of the sweet jar. Something you are doing on this ordinary morning. Just a position and hold it still. Let us take this picture for a moment. Let us record this moment. An ordinary day in our office. Quite, sort of, uh, quite a lot of people work here, clearly. And I can see people who are having their first cup of coffee maybe in the day. Somebody is checking the timetable and writing up things on the timetable. It looks like somebody's on the phone, but it's that moment in the morning where you're just waking up. I can see, uh, yes, somebody taking a suite. It's the little things that we all do when we start work, when we arrive at the office in the morning. People pouring themselves a cup of coffee, some people on the phone. I'm going to ask you in a moment to just Bring this to life as an ordinary morning. Yeah. 
Okay, I'm good. Thank you. Come and sit down. I'm creating the idea of location just through these pieces of paper. And starting perhaps to build up people's images in their heads for the place where we work and starting to transform the room into this place that we collectively agree this is our workspace, this is the job. very different way of working than teachers. Uh, I often say, if you follow Dorothy Hethcote's methods, it changes you as a teacher. It changes how you think about teaching and learning, and how you operate in the classroom. So I'm aware that for most of you, this is a new thing. So have you any first thoughts on, on, on what's going on here? <laughs> what's going on? Why might you work this way? And what were your thoughts? What were you saying to each other? You go back. Yeah, we were saying that what what we allow the students to do is to construct their environment. Environment is not an authentic environment. We are set. We are agreeing on a on a frame. It's an agreement, and how this frame is eventually filled or interpreted is up to the student himself, and it's. Um, the idea of constructivism anyway, so this is what we ought to do. So you're constructing it together, yes, very much as a theme. You've got individual images in your mind, maybe it's individual, but it's also collective. We share this space. Any other thoughts? Yes? I feel your point. Something really interesting. Um, yes, to bring things up to life and the imagination and also doing this together. Yes. There is a drama in the mind, imagination. Creative thinking. All of these things are true, yes. There's a thing about... Dorothy talked about how in the classroom, um, things are set up in such a way that for children, it's they come into a classroom and they enter into this way of being as a student. They are sitting there, they have certain expectations about what will happen in the classroom, the way things will work. And so they, um, just as this morning, when you came in and the chairs were in, in a row and you all sat down and you knew that what was going to happen was you were going to look at something there and you were going to hear someone speak. That was your expectation. So when we're teachers and students in the classroom, we have an expectation of what is going to happen. And in many ways, I think that means that the students are there looking at the teacher and thinking, okay, teacher is going to tell us what to do. That's the way it works in the classrooms. But in drama, you can change all that. You can change the whole room. And when you change the room, you change people's expectations of what will happen. And it gets away from teacher dependence. <clears throat> Do you know what I mean when I say teacher dependence? Children are dependent on the teacher because they're expecting the teacher to lead. So we're changing. It's not just about drama as an activity that you're doing. We're changing the dynamic in the classroom. We're changing the way that teachers and students work together. <coughs> and this way of working is seen as a way of uh, motivating young people because they are now no longer simply doing things because teacher says so. They are doing it for their company. They get a sense of ownership over this is our company. We run this zoo, don't we? we are, we've got an important job to do. And I suppose putting signs up like this, you start to own the space as well. This is our space. Come on in then. Morning. Morning. Had a nice weekend? Yes. Good. Right. I've been checking over these special jobs and uh, I've done you out a job card because these are obviously important enough to have everything recorded. Who's dealing with that set of invalid boots? Uh, you got started on the design. Good. Well, you'll see there's a job description and any problems that arise 
That's your work for the day then, uh, Sarah. Uh, can you just get yourself settled down and get stitching or whatever needs doing? You'll find the chairs, the cleaners put them over there, you know what she's like. Uh, who's dealing with that? As Sarah goes off to start on her invalid boots, yeah. the factory manager issues the rest of the day's work. To stretch the children's imagination, she's included leather work other than just shoes. A money belt for a bank cashier to wear. A camel bag for an explorer in the desert. Three sets of elephant shoes for a film about Hannibal crossing the Alps. A dog sleigh harness for a team of huskies in the Antarctic and a harness for a steeplejack. And though each child has come prepared with a working drawing of his or her own task, its manufacture during the lesson will open up vast areas of learning as teacher and students make the drama work together. No more long. How long did you want? Oh, to the attic again. 32 metres. 32 metres. Is this for the uh, is this for the dog uh, sleigh harness? Can you machine it together? Well, I think you'd better just get onto the wholesaler and uh, and order what you think you need. What width of strapping are you doing for the dogs? A three-inch strap. Yes, three inch for the chest harnesses. Uh, How long are you making the actual, uh, you know, reins for the team driver? Well, I mean, not how long. How wide? You know, three inch or? No, they're just an inch and a half. Yeah. No, I should think they'd be strong. I mean, really, what you'd use for a horse would be strong enough, maybe, for a dog team. And that's a really strong kind of leather as well. Yes. You mean these are going to be patterned? Yeah. Yes. But when he's wearing it, it won't look like a money belt, will it? Otherwise, they'll rob him. Ah, oh, it's just going to be embossed. Uh, are you going to think of any colour? I mean, is it going to look like a cowboy belt? It's just going to be like a normal belt. But in fact, it can contain a lot of money. Yes. Yes. You'll have to get your dimension. How big's a pound note? Does anybody know how big a pound note is? Yeah, you're going to have to get your pound note dimensions really accurate, aren't you? I'll see if I've got a pound note in my purse and then we'll check that. Uh, have they said how big this fella is that has to travel on public transport with money? No. Well, look, I'll tell you what. Ring Barclays Bank and ask them what size of belt. <coughs> I suppose we could work it out. Does anybody know what's a good average size for a grown man to have a belt? You know, for this money belt for Barclays Courier. 28 inches waist. Mm. The cutting machine's what? Not cutting. 32. No, 32. I'll see to that. Well, cut it by hand. 32. What? What's your waist sizes? Your dad's waist the 40. Well, then we need at least a 40. I mean, is he a good average man size? Well, then I think make it 48 or something like that till we can check. Everybody knows it's fiction. It's a drama. It's not real. Um, it's important that they understand it's not real and they're never fooled into thinking, at least in mind of the expert, that it's a real job they're doing or a real crime. And yet at the same time people take it on board and accept it and act as if it is real um, and become invested in it as if it is real. And one of the things Dorothy talks about is we actually learn things in life because we have a need to learn something. We need it now. The problem in teaching in schools is that children are learning something like a foreign language and they don't need it now immediately. They may be told, oh, you will need this when you leave school, but at the moment it doesn't have that need. But this drama work, Mantle of the Expert work, creates that need. We need to know this now because we need to do it now for our client.
what sort of things could you see that was, I think Dorothy as a teacher had certain teaching aims that she was working through. So what kind of things could you observe? What were they learning as they were doing these jobs? Playing in a sense at being in a shoe factory. What do you say? Definitely problem solving. And even though it's an imaginary setting and the children would take it very seriously and they were very engaged, engaged. So they were encountering problems. I kept thinking, oh, they could Google it, but of course they couldn't. <laughs> so they really had to come up with um, solutions. And they did it by helping each other, by, um, and she was prompting new avenues, as in like, why don't you call the bank? Why don't you just inquire this and that? Or um, asking about proportions and, um, and um, really um, trying to get to their world knowledge and think of your father, how, how, or like how tall is a man and how, how's your waist? Um, there was maths in it. Um, yeah, it was plenty. They, they have some images and they create their uh, details colors, little stuff, what they do. Uh, and so their experience, it's um, like real. Really if nice it's experience. deeper learning, mm -hmm. they will not forget. Yes, yes. In this, with this way, uh, they're learning very deep, very, very good way. So they don't forget this, what they do. What they do. One thing that you try to do in this kind of work, when you're a teacher, is not talk like a teacher. So you're not trying to tell them things. Because you want them to find out things themselves. Um, so you're trying to talk more like a colleague to them. How would a colleague talk if you're running a business together? Dorothy was in a kind of management role there, but she was still trying to talk to them like a colleague, like saying, well, how, how big is a pound note then? Or, or um, <coughs> yes, what would be the usual size of a belt? As if that she's working it out with them. But at the same time, she's got her teaching aims. She's trying to make them think concretely about proportions, about dimensions, about applying those knowledge and that skill, those skills in that context. Was there anything about this that surprised you or you thought, I don't get that, or that's very, um, very different from the usual way of working? Anything surprised you about it? Brenda, you said you were surprised about something. Is that right? Um, yes, because we talked and you asked, you couldn't imagine that it works with so your seven children, students or so. Maybe it could be a little bit complicated and I said, no, it works. It really works. If you are um, convinced that you can and will do it, so it will work with also with the students because they take you serious. But you have to change your position. Change your position yeah. as a teacher? Yes. Yes. Is that difficult? Um, if you aren't used to it and if you're going to do it for the first time, thoughts of, oh, I have to change and I have to teach in another way. It's difficult at the beginning. But if you try and um, first for the first time and you see the reaction of the students, they are going to take it serious because I'm taking it serious. And you see that it works. You are getting more and more confident. And uh, so it is a shift to work in a different way and it can feel like a risk that you're taking. Yes. yes. And not go to the teacher and say, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so they go to the next student and tell them, can you help me or something else? <clears throat> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Because one of the things that I, if I, when I've taught in schools, one of the things I don't like is, okay, you ask children to do something and then one child finishes and comes to you and says, what do I do now? And I think, oh, next. <laughs> but when I, I remember one occasion I was uh, working with a group and I had set a task to begin with. And then 
Some children were still working on it, others had finished. But they were all doing things. They'd all gone off to look on a computer, to, to research something or write something, and they decided that for themselves. And I was just so, so happy to see that at that moment, because they had that. They, had, they were free from teacher dependence at that moment. Like they said, um, when they need help, they go to other students or people and uh, and the teacher take, is in the middle you said not yes in the back not in, not the in front, front of the blackboard but in the middle of the group yeah. just as a member of the class and yes. they are sharing their ideas freely yeah and they move through the mm -hmm. whole room and can share their ideas take responsibility St not static mobile yes so the room feels different. She's done things in that space to transform it so it doesn't feel like a classroom. Mm -hmm. They've got things around them which are build up this sense of this is our company and this is our firm and this is where we work. There's a, there's a table, for example, with mugs on it. And when they, every now and then in this company, they have a break, they have a tea break and they sit there with their cups and there's nothing in them. There's no tea or coffee, but they are sitting there like this. And it amused me once with a class. We had a tea urn and we were doing our mantle. And we actually had an actual break, a real break. I said, we need to stop there for 15 minutes. And children were going over to this imaginary urn and making themselves <laughs> imaginary cups of coffee and eating imaginary <laughs> Once I worked with Dorothy on a project about the Cherokee Native American tribe. This was a tribe in Native American tribe that were forced to move from their homeland to another part of the country, forced by the powers that be, the white government, to move because their land was wanted, their land was valuable. Um, white people wanted their land, and so they were forced to move. And it was called the Trail of Tears. And in this work, Dorothy chose to work on this, which is a, a diary supposedly written by a boy who was a Cherokee and who went on the Trail of Tears. She took this as the starting point and she took extracts from it. So here we have an extract, um, a diary entry about before the Trail of Tears, Jesse Smoke here is writing about a day when he was sitting at home and he was sitting on his stoop, which is like the porch at the front of the cabin. And he's got his, fa his grandfather's gun, musket, and some white men come. And some white men are standing at the other side of the fence, talking and looking at him. Can I have somebody who will be our um, Jesse Smoke with the gun, sitting on his stoop or porch. So Jesse's the Cherokee, yes? Yes. And we have a group of men, although they don't have to be played by men, standing on the other side of the fence, watching, looking, Portuguese. thinking, Portuguese. interested in this land in what might be hidden in this land. There might be some treasure or gold that these Cherokees have. They want the land, they want the things that this Cherokee might have. There's a sense that something could happen. It could be a dangerous situation. So we need to think about this moment when Jesse Smoke is sitting and he's got his, his rifle. Now we can mime a rifle. Or we could use this. <laughs> I once did this with in a university, and I took in to work with the students. I took in an actual rifle. Ooh. It was deactivated, meaning it was not working, so it was safe. But I thought. If I tell the university that I'm bringing in a rifle, <laughs> they will say no, or there will be so much paperwork to do. So I just took it in. I didn't <laughs> it in. And it had a, a real rifle, 
had a great impact in what we were doing. In drama, you don't need to have the real objects. You can have something that stands in like no. this, but we've all got to agree this is going to be the right one. And sometimes in drama work, you do choose to use the real object. <coughs> so we need to decide how Hussein is holding this gun. Hussein knows that these men could be dangerous. And he knows that there could be real problem here. And we know he's cleaning the gun. So there are the men over there. At this moment, just still. He's cleaning the gun, but he's a bit worried. I mean, a bit... Not extrovert, but a bit worried about the people outside. So he is aware of the danger. So worried because maybe he thinks that he cannot. He is not secure at home. So he knows he's not secure because this could be dangerous. Mm -hmm. So he's not looking at them. So what is he looking at? His rifle. And sometimes outside. So if he's cleaning the rifle, has he got? Where's he? Right, was he on his lap or where is he? Want to show us? What do you think? I think it must be. I, I'm not sure, but like that cleaning. Ready, ready to shoot? <laughs> <laughs> if you're cleaning it, then it's not ready to shoot, is it? Sure. You're cleaning it, and he's just looking at that. Mm -hmm. You just take a position. So at the moment you are cleaning it, but let's say you start off with you're not looking at you're looking at the gun. Because in this situation you have, yes, he's just cleaning the gun, but his, his gun in his hand is also power, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's a sign. It's a sign. Because they know he could use it. He could use it on them. But at the same time, he's, he, afraid. he's afraid. And he doesn't want to have to use it on them. Mm -hmm. Ready to use, but, but he can. And when, and if he moved, it seems to me you're saying that, I mean, Sevgi, you made this gesture, which was quite slow. Do you think he would be slowly cleaning this gun? And also there was a suggestion that he might be, okay, he's looking down. You're suggesting he might be looking up from time to time. Is he just kind of checking them out? Mm. Just seeing what's happening? Or is he also just giving them little indications that I know you're there? Possibly. Maybe he just gives them the, the look that I, I would if I had to. I would if I had to. Okay. And what about those three? They're ready for action, they're ready to take him on, or are they standing close together? Are they avoiding eye contact with him? They're thinking that, could we take this man on, I suppose? They're thinking, could we attack this place? Could we steal the money that might be hidden there? But there's danger as well for them, I suppose. So how are they standing? What do we want? What, how do we think they should be? I don't think they want to uh, hide the locations. They, they want to, I would say, send the message of real threat. And he is also indicating that he doesn't want to fight, he's not offensive, but alert, I would say. So how do they send the signal to the people they are? Daring and um, cha challenging in their way, in their strong, huddled, with their rifles in their hand, staring at him and talking, okay. whispering so, to each other. So they're whispering to each other, but they're looking at him, is that right? I think, let's just... Slow that down a little bit. Just be aware that one false move in this situation and he could shoot. If he feels threatened, he could shoot. So I think anything you do, you'll probably do slowly. If they are... If they're confrontational like this and they look very much, they mean business. I wonder what it might be, why they decide not to, or when they decide, what point would they decide to go away? Because that's what they do, they don't attack. We shouldn't do that. So it's too dangerous. It's too dangerous. He has a rifle and we don't know this area. It's better we go. Okay, so they're quietly considering this together. 
Mm-hmm. What do you think? Is this a good? Could we take this man on? This is what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. Can we just see it frozen for a moment? The strongest image is when you're just looking at them. And I almost feel like you should, when you speak, and you, should you don't even move. But you're talking because you know how dangerous it is. <coughs> and so it can, you can speak like it without moving. You can just be saying what you think. Should we? I think the whispering maybe there was a lot of tension, wasn't there? For us, we couldn't hear them, but it was whispering a lot of tension in that situation. Thank you very much, Roger. A laboratory to explore human behavior and how it can be used to do that in the classroom. And how really you're using sign, because in that we were looking very closely at sign and how human beings behave in this situation. And every little gesture starts to count. And in this kind of work, you find that the sign, everybody is looking at sign and reading sign and exploring it. How does this tie in with the commission model? Because the commission model came out of Mount of the Expert, but it's a real client and a real commission. But I think some of the same things apply because you're still transforming the space. You're still using the space as a laboratory to explore. So if your commission is, as with Dorothy's big project that she did with the commission model, was about a hospital garden. And the focus of it really all the way through was, what do people need a garden for? What will they need it for? Who will benefit and how will they benefit? And everything that Dorothy did with the group was a kind of laboratory to explore those questions through using some drama means, as well as other means, such as we, they did scientific experiments to find out about how plants would grow, the best plants would grow in this environment. They did a lot of research themselves, but still the thing holding it together was drama. Drama was the, kind of the glue that held everything together. Drama as a laboratory. 